Earl struggled a lot in his life. He struggled after coming home from World War II to find a job, his career never really was able to settle into a certain path. He bounced around from job to job. He struggled in his own personal life, in his own spiritual life, often disregarding the counsel of his godly parents. He chose to walk a very wayward road and to associate uh, with a lot of just uh, wayward people. He also struggled in his family life. He married young, had three kids right away. But his relationship with them over the years became really centered more on fear and intimidation than tender love. He had a kind of a critical spirit about him, a harsh words that would often at any moment erupt into violence and abuse. And the kids remember hearing him abusing their mom uh, at night and wondering if they would be next. All three of the kids kind of struggled with how to relate to their dad. He would come and go. He would often run around on his mom and go out with other women and come back in, but really he was like a storm that would blow in and blow out and leave a trail of pain behind him. The youngest brother decided to just try to disappear. And so he tried to be scarce most of the time. When he was old enough, he went into the military just like his father. After returning back from Vietnam later in life, he ended up repeating the same patterns of his father. The middle daughter just took all that pain and insecurity and stuffed it inside and it turned her very angry and she never really could trust a man again and went through multiple relationships, never really fully happy. But the oldest son chose a different path. The oldest son, though it was hard, though it took years, he chose to forgive his dad for his past sins against him and his family. He, he worked hard to forge a relationship with his dad. And he really was committed to not passing on this same dysfunction to his children. And I'm really grateful for that because that older son is my dad. And I learned more about forgiveness from my father than I ever learned from a book or a message. I watched him do it over and over and over again. Forgiveness is powerful. Forgiveness changes people. It changes generations of people. And forgiveness is absolutely necessary if you're going to have any kind of lasting relationship because you, there's always going to be some offense and so I, we have to learn to receive and to extend forgiveness if we want relationships at last. I was reading about this this week in an article and, and some words just kind of jumped off the page at me and I, I thought I'd share it with you. I read these words, one of the most important things parents can do is to create a culture of forgiveness in their home. A culture of forgiveness. You know, we're in this series built to last and we're looking at these commitments that you have to make in your family for your family to last and to thrive. And this is a big one. This is commitment number six. And so I'll just put it up there on the screen. Families that are built to last create a culture of forgiveness. So let me just ask you, do you have a culture of forgiveness in your home? Do you talk about forgiveness? Do you practice forgiveness? Is this woven into the fabric of your family? And if you're struggling with that, as most of us are, 
Well, then we have to go to God's word because God's word gives us a picture of how to do just that. So I want you to get your Bible. I want you to do what we always do, open up God's word. Uh, we're gonna turn this morning to Genesis chapter 50. So it is the last chapter of the first book of the Bible, okay? Genesis 50. And uh, when you turn there, what we're gonna discover is that the, the scene kind of opens up at a funeral. I'm a pastor, I've done a lot of funerals over the years. And in fact, uh, what I've discovered about funerals is that if there's any rift in the family, it's probably gonna surface at a funeral, okay? I, I think it's just all the emotions are raw and family members are forced to be together that normally try to stay away from each other. And when that happens, you're just gonna see it bubble up to the top. Well, that's exactly what's happening here. They're at a funeral, they're all together and, and kind of these underlying hidden uh, rifts in the family are going to start surfacing. And, and yet we're gonna learn here in that about how to have a culture of forgiveness. So let's look at it. Uh, Genesis chapter 50, beginning at verse 15, all right? This is the word of God. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said to one another, if Joseph is holding a grudge against us, he will certainly repay us for all the suffering we caused him. So they sent this message, sent this message to Joseph. Before he died, your father gave a command, say to this to Joseph, please forgive your brother's transgression, their sin, the suffering they caused you. Therefore, please forgive the transgression, the servants of God and of your father. And Joseph wept when their message came to him. His brothers also came to him and bowed down before him and said, we are your slaves. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. Therefore, don't be afraid. I will take care of you and your children. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. And Joseph and his father's family remained in Egypt. And Joseph lived 110 years. Now stop right there. I guess you could call this a dysfunctional family, all right? They had ish use, okay? They had a lot of dynamics, a lot of, much more than we can unpack. But of course, one of the greatest issues was the relationship between Joseph and his, and his uh, 12, bro, uh, 11 brothers. Mo these were really more half brothers, but but there, there was a lot of tension between them. They, they always saw Joseph as the one that daddy liked the most. They were jealous of Joseph. And at one point, they literally plotted to kill him, to murder their own brother. But thankfully, cool, cooler heads prevailed, and they decided not to kill him, but rather to just sell him into slavery, I mean, which was a horrible existence, if you can imagine. And so they did just that. They trafficked him. They sold him into slavery. And, and there he went to Egypt as a common slave. He was purchased as a slave there. Uh, he served as a slave. He, later on, he has this ongoing, seems like one bad thing after another type of experience where he gets falsely accused of a crime. He's thrown, thrown into prison, forgotten there. And, and you can just imagine how easy it would be for Joseph to be angry and resentful for all that these brothers had done to him. If there was anybody that was probably should have plotted against them to get them back and even the score, it would have been him, right? Maybe you know what that feels like. Maybe you know what it's like to be abandoned or to be pushed off or cut out. Your own family to turn their back on you or to reject you or to act like you don't even exist. Then you, if, if that's happening, you understand the gravity of the pain that that causes. And here is Joseph. He is rejected by his family, uh, sold as a common slave, now in prison. And yet God had a plan for Joseph. God had a plan bigger than what he could conceive or even his family could conceive. God would eventually, through a, a working of miracles, uh, elevate Joseph to the second in command of Egypt. 
And, and in that position, he would be able to interpret a dream that a drought was coming and begin to give leadership to harvest the grain early and to, and to have reserves, not only to provide for the Egyptian people, but ultimately for his own family. Now, he didn't see it at the time, but God had this great plan. And what we learned from Joseph in this story is really a picture of how to cultivate a culture, how to create this culture of forgiveness. So I want to give you a couple of things, very practical things we learned from this story about how to create a culture of forgiveness in your family, okay? All right, so paper out, pen out, let's write a couple of these things down. Number one, jot this down. If you want to create a culture of forgiveness in your home, then it starts with this. You have to model forgiveness, <laughs> That sounds pretty obvious, doesn't it? But you got to model forgiveness. You want your children to forgive, then they need to see you forgive. If you want to see your grandchildren forgive, they need to see you forgiving and talking about forgiveness and exchanging forgiveness. I mean, it's one thing to just say we, we think forgiveness is a good idea, but are you living it out for them? And that's really what you see here with Joseph. Joseph begins to live out forgiveness. Uh, after his father dies, the 11 brothers that sold him into slavery, they started getting worried, right? They're starting to wring their hands. They're going, oh no, daddy's dead now. Surely the hammer's going to come down. Now he's going to get even. He's going to throw the gloves off and give us what we finally deserve. And so they come up with this kind of fake news story about, oh yeah, you know, right before he died, uh, dad said these words, hey, be sure you're good to your brothers. And, and they, they got this messenger to send it to Joseph. And why are they doing all this? Because they're so afraid. They have so much guilt over what they've done. And they're afraid that Joseph is now going to change his mind. Here's the deal. Joseph had already forgiven them. If you go back to chapter 45, when Joseph reveals himself as their brother and now the second in command, it, it's a touching moment. I mean, he's crying. He embraces his brothers. He kisses them. Can you imagine? He, he forgives them. He says, God has brought me here to take care of you. I mean, it is this beautiful picture of forgiveness. And from that point on, Joseph is nothing but kind, nothing but gracious. He brings them to Egypt. He gives them a great land to live on. He provides for them. Everything's great. But now that dad's dead, they're conjuring up all these old pains all over again. And Joseph has to revisit this offense all over again. You may have heard the phrase, forgive and forget. You ever heard that? When you say that, it kind of implies that forgiveness is just kind of like a switch. You know, I, I'm, I don't forgive and flip, now I do forgive. It's a very binary, one-time event. Uh, I forgive and now it's over. Um, one and done, right? But the truth is that forgiveness is seldom like that especially the deep hurts, those pains tend to resurface over and over again. Somebody does something, it reminds you of an offense that you had or what somebody did to you a long time ago. And those pains resurface. And what you have to do is you have to choose every time they come back up to forgive. Forgiveness is not an event, it's a process. <laughs> It is a reoccurring thing, and that's what Joseph is doing. He's modeling for us that when, e when, even when past pains resurface, I have to choose to forgive. Now, you may stop right here and say, all right, preacher, what, what, what exactly do you mean by forgive, all right? I'm kind of tracking with you, but I'm not sure I agree with you. What, what exactly do you mean by forgiveness? Let me tell you what I don't mean. I don't mean forgive means, ah, oh, well, I minimize the offense. I don't mean, well, you pretend like it didn't happen or you say it's okay or you go back to the way it was and it just perpetuates over and over and over and over and over. That's not what I talk about when I talk about forgiveness. Forgiveness in a biblical sense is really a, a twofold move. It is first, I release the offense to God. I say, God, here is what has happened to me, and I'm releasing this to you. 
God, I'm not going to carry this anymore. I'm not going to bear the burden anymore. I'm not going to let this define me anymore. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to continually relive this anymore. God, I'm just going to give this offense to you. It is a, it is a vertical exchange where I give it to God. And then, only once I've done that, then I have this horizontal exchange where I extend forgiveness to that person that hurt me. And that is an act of grace. You know what grace is? Grace is undeserved favor, right? So they, you don't deserve it, but I give it to you anyway, and I extend grace to you in spite of what you've done. I no longer keep a record of the wrong. I no longer revisit and replay in my mind all the things you did to me. I no longer recount them in my mind and, and allow that to stir up anger and resentment against uh, in my own heart toward you. I just choose to give grace and extend forgiveness. That is biblical forgiveness. And it's something here that Joseph is going to show us. I mean, Joseph had already forgiven them, but now he has to choose to do it all over again to them. To create a culture of forgiveness, you've got to model it. Joseph is modeling it to his family. My father modeled it to me on multiple occasions, how to forgive. So the question is, are you modeling forgiveness to your family? Are you setting the pace in forgiveness? Are they learning how to forgive by looking to you and seeing how to forgive because they watch you do it? If you wanna create a culture of forgiveness, number one, you gotta model it, right? Number two, uh, you need to leave the door open for reconciliation. You need to leave the door open for reconciliation. Joseph's response is quite interesting. Look at verse 17. It says, Joseph wept when their message came to him, and his brothers also came and bowed down before him and said, we are your slaves. I know what's going on here. It says that Joseph, first thing when he hears this message, this fake message that, you know, daddy said in his last breath, you know, take care of the brothers. But when he hears this, he immediately knows that this is a made-up deal. And he weeps. Now, you can read 10 commentaries and you'll get 10 reasons why they think Joseph wept. Nobody really knows, okay? So I'm just telling you. We don't know. We can think we know what it is. Maybe it's just here I am reliving all this pain again and it brings it back up and it's still tender and emotional to him. Maybe he's upset because they don't trust him and they don't really think that he's forgiven them. We don't know. But what we do know is that Joseph is bent toward forgiveness. We do know that. And then here come the brothers, and when they come to him, they're literally throwing themselves at his mercy. They fall on their knees. They say, we're your slaves. Have mercy on us. Right? They're afraid. But they are, in a sense, repentant because they, they, they admit in verse 17 that it is a sin. It is a transgression that they've done what is wrong against him. They, they're, they're not deflecting it. They're not minimizing it. They're not blaming anybody else. They're saying, we did evil uh, to you. And in this little exchange here, in verse 17 and 18, what you find here is the recipe for reconciliation, okay? This is really, really important. How do you get to a point of reconciliation? Reconciliation requires two parties to bring something to the table. First, there has to be, the offended party has to bring repentance to the table. Now, when I say repentance, I'm talking about not just saying I'm sorry. That's part of it. Godly sorrow is a part of it. But also a change of mind and a change of behavior. There has to be a change. I mean, repentance means to turn around. I'm going this way, I turn around, and now I'm going this way. Uh, repentance means a change of heart, a change of mind, and a change of action. And so they have to turn around and say, you know what, I am repenting of this. This is not how I'm going to do again. I'm not going to go that direction. And there's a true brokenness in repentance. And then they bring that to the table. Then the, the hurt party, the offended party, what they bring to the table is forgiveness. And it is through, it's like, when, when you have repentance and you have forgiveness put together, it creates this bond, see, that, that is renewed and strong. Now, this, by the way, parents, is a great thing to teach your kids. Right, when your kids get into a scuffle when they're little, right? Billy pulls Susie's hair, right? Or he runs off and pulls the head off her baby doll or whatever, you know, he does, you know, what boys do. Uh, you know, uh, 
it's a great teaching moment to, to get them together and, and for him to articulate repentance. Hey, I'm sorry that was wrong. I know I offended you. I, I burned your baby doll or whatever I did to you. And so I'm, I'm sorry. I won't do that anymore. Repentance. And then for her to say, uh, he, he asked, will you forgive me? And she says, I forgive you. And just learning that process, even at a young age, is, is training them how to reconcile. It's very, very important. I mean, I remember Liz and I doing that for our girls early on, teaching them how to ask and receive forgiveness. But get this, they also need to see that in your marriage and in your relationships with adults. This asking and receiving forgiveness, there's repentance. That's what reconciliation is like. And listen, this is what we all want. You can't have a family that's built to last. You can't have a relationship to last without that process of reconciliation, right? Unless there's repentance, unless there's forgiveness, there, there will always be a rift. But when that does come together, then you can have reconciliation and even the relationship can grow stronger as a result of it. So here Joseph is modeling not only forgiveness, but he's also showing us how reconciliation uh, is done. Now, you might ask the question, well, can I forgive someone that is unrepentant? You may say, well, Pastor, I, I got a problem. You know, I got somebody that's not repentant. Can I forgive them? And the answer to that question is yes. Yes, you can forgive a person that is unrepentant because remember, forgiveness is uh, giving it to God and releasing that person from the offense. But can you be reconciled without repentance? No. Reconciliation requires both repentance and forgiveness. It requires both parties to move toward it. The third thing that we learn here from this story about creating a culture of forgiveness, one is I gotta model it, number two, I gotta work and leave the door open for reconciliation. But the, the third thing here is I need to humbly trust God. I need to humbly trust God. And I want you to see this here. Joseph gives the reason for his forgiveness. This is probably one of the, most, the two most important verses in this passage, all right? We're gonna dive now down into the foundation of forgiveness. Why do we forgive? Why can we forgive? What motivated Joseph to forgive? I guess you could call this the theology of forgiveness that is found in this passage, right? It's in verse 19 and 20, so look at it. He said, Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. There it is. There is a core foundation of forgiveness. This is why you can forgive. This is why Joseph forgave. Because ultimately our forgiveness is rooted in and grounded in a trust in God. A trust in God. That is why we forgive. Now, I want you to notice, he, had, he trusts God for two things. First thing, he trusted God to act justly with this offense. He trusted God to act justly. Look, notice he goes, am I in the place of God? <laughs> am I your judge? And the implication is what? No, no, I'm not your judge. I'm not in the place of God. That's God's judge, uh, job to judge you. He knows the intention of the heart. He knows what really happened. He knows the motives. He knows it all. And God will do that. And that's not what Joseph's saying. That's not my place to punish you and to judge you. God will do that. It reminds me of uh, Romans 12, 19. It says, friends, do not avenge yourselves Instead, live room for the God's wrath because it is written, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. And when you hold on to anger and when you want to lash out and you want that person to hurt and you want to, to exercise vengeance and vindication on this person who hurt you, you're, you're stepping in the place of God. God is the one that does that. God understands it all, God sees it all, and God will act justly in your circumstance. And so we trusted God to do that. 
And secondly, Joseph trusted God to take what was bad and make it good. Look, he says, God planned this for good. I mean, yeah, this was terrible what happened to me, but God, God used it for good. And so he's trusting that even something bad happens to me, I'm going to trust God that somehow, in some way, I can't see it now, but somehow, in some way, God's going to work this for good in the future. I want you to think about it for just a minute. If, if Joseph had never been sold into slavery, then Joseph would have never gone to Egypt. If Joseph had never gone to Egypt, then he would have never gone to Potiphar's house. If he had never gone to Potiphar's house, then he would have never been falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and thrown into a prison. If he had never gone to prison, he would have never met there this cupbearer and this baker that had dreams and he would have interpreted these dreams. If he had never interpreted those dreams, then, then they would have never uh, told Pharaoh about this guy in prison that interpreted my dream and, and Pharaoh would never call him up to interpret his dream. If he had never interpreted Pharaoh's dream, then he would have never been elevated to second in command to provide all the, the reserves for the nation and to protect the nation, and if he had never provided the reserves for the nation, then there would have been no reserves to take care of his own family, and if his own family had not been provided for, then his own family would have, have died, and the nation of Israel would have never come to fruition. If the nation of Israel had never come to fruition, then there would never have been a Messiah to come up through the nation of Israel, and if there had been no Messiah to come up through the nation of Israel, you and I would still be dead in our sins. Now, did Joseph see all that at the beginning? No, but God did. And so Joseph trusted that God is going to do something. God is at work here. I don't see it. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know how this will work out. Listen, you may not even see it in your own lifetime. It may be a couple of generations down the road, but God sees it all. And so Joseph had this trust in God. I'm going to trust God that he's going to deal with this justly. It's not my job to do it. God will be faithful to do it. And at the same time, God's going to take what was evil and he's going to somehow turn it for good. Now listen, people will hurt you. People will reject you. People will abuse you. People will do terrible things. And it is bad. And it is evil and I'm not minimizing that at all. It is what it is. But God is able to take even those terrible things and turn it for good. And you can trust him in it. It wasn't good that my dad lived and grew up in an abusive home. That wasn't good. But God used it for good to drive him to Christ so that he would hear the gospel and that he would break a chain of dysfunction that I and my children and my grandchildren will now benefit from. It, it, so let me just say this. If, if, trust, if, if forgiveness is rooted in our trust in God, then our lack of forgiveness is now then rooted in what? A lack of trust in God. Will you trust him to do what is just? Will you trust him to right the wrong? Will you trust him to even use what is bad and turn it for good? We're talking about creating a culture of forgiveness. I've got to model it. I've got to work toward reconciliation. I've got to trust God in it, which is really kind of the root of it all. But let me just wrap up with this last one here. If I want to create a culture of forgiveness, I need to pass on blessing instead of bitterness. Look at verse 21. It says, therefore, don't be afraid. I'll take care of you and your children. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. And Joseph and his father's family remained in Egypt. And they, Joseph lived 110 years. <laughs> Joseph chose to, to not be bitter, but to be a blessing to his family. Even the ones that hurt him. And their children. And their children. Joseph chose the path of blessing, not the path of bitterness. You know, bitterness, bitterness affects you. I mean, bitterness shrivels your soul. I mean, even physiologically, you look at a person that's angry for years, bitter for years, and, and they have all these physical problems. 
that you just see it. It not only affects you spiritually and even psychologically, but physiologically. And here is Joseph. He lives 110 years, man. I mean, he's living a long life. This man who could have and maybe should have in our mind been angry and bitter, he chose to bless and not curse, to give and not take. And think about the legacy he left, not only to his brothers, but to their children and their children. They're all talking about Uncle Joseph, the merciful. Uncle Joseph, the blesser. Uncle Joseph, the forgiver. In fact, his influence still reaches you today because we're talking about him. So here's the question. What legacy are you leaving for your kids? Are you leaving a legacy of brokenness, of anger, of resentment? Well, this is what happened and, and, and just constantly dredging up the past and reliving the offenses and, and really teaching your children and even their children how to be angry and bitter and unforgiving. Or are you leaving a legacy of blessing, of forgiveness, of freedom, of grace, of healing? That's the legacy. You know, Joseph here is really a picture of Jesus in many ways. I don't have time to go through the similarities, but you know, they're, they're, both, um, they're both rejected. They're both sold into slavery. They both are unjustly treated. They both forgive radically those who have hurt them. Even Jesus, as they were nailing him into the cross, said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Joseph, listen to me, Joseph is a picture of Jesus to his family. The question is, are you? Are you a reflection of Jesus? Do people, when they look at you and they see the things that you've gone through and they see the people that have hurt you, do they see in your countenance and in your response Jesus, the giver of grace, the great forgiver, Jesus the merciful, Listen, do they see you model this? Do they see you work to reconcile? Do they see you um, trusting God? Do they see you blessing and not cursing? Listen, when they do that, then you will create a culture of forgiveness that will outlive you and will live on from generation to generation. Would you bow your heads with me for just a minute? I realize that anytime I speak on forgiveness, that we all hear this message through the filter of the pain in our own life. And right now, you can probably pull up in your mind those who have hurt you, those who have offended you, those who have mistreated you. You have that list in your hand of the list of wrongs that have been committed against you and those that you love. And you're clenching it with white knuckled grip. But I want you to understand that as you hold on to that list, it will suffocate you. You won't create a culture of forgiveness in your home. You'll, You'll pass on anger and resentment. And really the only way that we can release that list and the only way we can extend forgiveness to others is first to have received forgiveness from God. So if you're here today and you're like unsure of your walk with God, you don't know for sure if you're right with God. You realize your own sin. So many times we judge other people by their behavior, but our, we judge ourselves by our intentions. Well, I didn't mean to do that, so it's not as bad, but, but we judge others by what they did to us. And listen, when you look at what we have done against God, we have offended Him. He has that list of offenses that we have created, those, that list of things that we have done to sin against Him and break His laws and break His heart. But instead of holding on to that list against us, holding it against us, he sent Jesus. 
And when Jesus went to the cross, he nailed that list of offenses to the cross. And he died in our place for our sin so that you could be free, so you could be forgiven. And maybe right now the Holy Spirit's convicting you that you have sinned against God and you need forgiveness. You need to be right with God. I'm not talking about going to church. I'm not trying to be, I'm talking about being a good person. I'm talking about the moment you ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and to forgive you and, and wipe the slate clean in your own heart. And if you are unsure about that, then I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. Just with everybody's head bowed, if you want to be free, if you want to be forgiven, if you want Jesus to wipe the slate clean, if you want to finally release these sins of your own past and experience the grace of God in your life, then with your head bowed, just I want you to lift up your hand and I'll pray for you. When you lift up your hand, you're just saying, Pastor, pray for me. I need Jesus. All right, thank you. Thank you. Lift up your hand where I can see it. Pastor, pray for me. All right, thank you. Thank you over there. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Right there. All right, anybody else? Several hands. Anybody else? Lift up your hand. All right. Okay. Why don't you just put your hand down right now? Just pray this prayer with me. God knows your heart. God sees your heart. Dear Lord, I know I have sinned against you. And I have done what is evil in your sight. But I believe that you died on a cross for me. And I believe you rose again from the dead. And so I'm asking you now, please forgive me. Please wash me clean. Clean the slate of sin in my life. And today I choose to follow you. with a grateful heart and with deep love. And Lord, fill my heart with forgiveness for those who have hurt me. Help me to show the same forgiveness that you have shown me. Father, I thank you for your word today. It's so relevant to us, Lord. And I know that as we walk out these doors, many in this room are walking back into a conflict at home with a spouse, back into a rift with a child or a parent. They're walking back into an issue at work. And Lord, we can so easily harbor the offenses. But Lord, help us this week to walk in forgiveness. Help us this week to choose the path of forgiveness and to create a culture of forgiveness in our home. Lord, we need you. We trust you for it. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.